All right. Um, welcome. This is exciting for me because um, I've been talking about Rails 3 for a long time. And uh, last year, and I think even before that, uh, we were talking a lot about all the plans we had for Rails 3, all the wonderful things that we wanted to do. Um, but it always feels kind of uh, hollow to be talking about future code. It's much more interesting in my mind to talk about existing code, which is why today uh, is a lot more special, because Rails 3 is, is here. We're not putting out the final release yet, but the code is there. Uh, we plan to put out either the final beta later today or the release candidate, depending on how, uh, how good we feel about it. Um, so since you guys are all here, and I saw the hands going up who have been playing with Rails 3 and who's been running stuff in production, now is definitely the time to get involved. Rails 3 is by far good enough to not only play with, but put stuff uh, live. Uh, at 37 Signals, we have at least a handful of applications that are already running in production, serving lots of requests on Rails 3. Um, we are in the process of converting all our major apps to it as well. Um, and that's pretty exciting. It's great to see something we've been working so hard on for so long actually being real, which is why I'd encourage everybody also just to try the, just the startup fresh experience. Start a new app, simulate your own, um, what are we calling that, the, the Rails uh, Rumble? Like basically put together a small app while you're here, try it out, because the fresh experience is really awesome. We've done a lot of things that are not just about improving things for existing applications. A lot of it is about improving the getting started experience. And we'd love to see a, a ton of feedback on that. Um, so I'm going to give you a presentation of the things that I basically care about in Rails 3. Rails 3 has tons and tons of new interesting parts and features and improvements. and. There's no way I could talk about all of them. So I'm just going to do the selfish bastard rundown, which is the four major features that really gets me excited. Um, one of the key things that gets me excited about any new version of Rails is taking out annoyances, taking out things that just been boiling my blood for too long until finally somebody does something about it or I do something about it. Um, one of the first things that I've been annoyed about for a really long time is this. When I download one of our 37 Signals apps that I haven't used in a long time, or I'm installing it on a new computer, and I'm trying to get it up and running. Now, up until this point, that's been sort of black magic, because all apps depend on a variety of things. They depend on gems, they depend on plugins, they depend on all sorts of setup. And the process I've had so far for figuring out what this app depends on is downloading, running the test, and seeing e break the test. Oh, oh, I had not installed this gem. All right, install that gem. Try it again. e And sooner or later, you start hating those E's. Um, and that's really just a crappy startup experience. And I've been seeing this for a long time, for years. Uh, and it's really been bothering me, especially because I remember back, I think, if not the very first RailsConf, then number two, um, James Duncan Davidson was giving a presentation on an e-commerce site they were making at the time. And he was talking about this repeatable environment that they had. They had everything summed up in one thing that they could just run, and they would get the right version of Apache and MySQL and the gems and everything. And magic would happen, and you could run it right away. And I thought for years about that story, like how awesome that environment would be. But I never took the time to, to make it happen. Um, so we sort of attacked this from a bunch of different weird angles. Um, one of them was called um, externals, which we ran through Capistrano, which was sort of this YAML setup for how to specify where you could get your um, uh, plugins from. But it certainly wasn't a whole solution. It didn't talk about gems. It just talked about all the internal stuff that we had at 37 Signals and all our plugins. And it was, it was all right, but it certainly wasn't, wasn't great. Now, what is great is Bundler. Um, this, the code on the screen right now, is actually the, uh, the bundle for, for Basecamp. 
We're not completely done with it yet, but as you can see, we just run through all the dependencies that we have. Uh, all the gems list them out by version. Some of them, we don't even care what version it is. Um, and you run this bundle install magic, and boom, your environment is there. And I can't tell you how big of a difference that makes for any app of even moderate complexity to just know all the dependencies that are there and be able to install them in just one command. Uh, Carl and Yehuda has done a fantastic job on this, despite tons and tons of pushback. Because I'd been seeing this screen for a long time. I knew the pain was there. If you had been working mainly on one app or two app and you had everything set up and you don't change it around a whole lot, you don't necessarily remember that pain all that often. It's something that happens to other developers setting up your app. So what do you care? Well, uh, you should care. Now, the pushback that originally came around or back from Bundler was forgetting one thing. The magic that Bundler does is that it creates its own little bubble. And that is both the blessing and the curse of the system. That it creates this little bundle where all the dependencies are mapped out. It also means that nothing um, you don't tell it to be there is there. Which, if we look back at this um, gem file that we have for, for, for Basecamp, things that I would forget all the time in the beginning and I would swear up and down about Bundler being a piece of shit until I, I figured out that oftentimes Oh, sometimes it was box, and oftentimes it was my own inability to just remember that Bundler is a bubble. So for example, if you don't map the MySQL gem, MySQL is not there. Bundler doesn't care that it's on your system, because like, the whole point is that you can have a system of all sorts of things, but you create this tiny little bubble where just the things that you say are there. So you need to say everything that you need in your app to be there. That's the number one trick. As soon as you internalize the fact that system gems do not exist as anything else but a cache for installing bundler gems, it all makes sense. The same thing with Ruby Debug, for example. And some of this is because our error messages aren't perfect. Like, you'd run Debugger in your app, and it'd say, oh, Debugger is not installed. And you're like, what are you talking about? I have it on the gem. Oh, I didn't list it in my, my gem file. Some of this, we should probably think harder about what can we include default by default, what should be listed as part of just a, a Rails requirement. But this will be true for a lot of other things. Tilt is a gem that one of our plugins that hasn't been converted to a gem depends on. Uh, and again, it was one of those things where I was like, what the hell? Why isn't this working? It's not working because I didn't mention it in my bubble. So Rails 3 is a lot part dealing with annoyances, things that just um, pisses you off, and now they don't piss you off anymore, which is great. But we're not just all about being grumpy old men. We're also about appreciating the beauty of things. Active record queries, which is basically taking um, act active relations and putting them into active record, um, has all this fancy relational algebra, blah, 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 blah. I don't even really care about that stuff. What I care about is my code got a whole lot prettier. If you take this um, very simple user all query, uh, you see like you have your all, you have your conditions, your name, your hash. It's sort of like a mouthful. And this is a really simple version of that. Like most or lots of queries have a lot more shit going on. Um, and it becomes sort of a long hash of all these other things, which is, which is kind of a hassle. Now, replace that with the new version we have in Rails 3. It's just a whole lot prettier. One of the key things, I'll talk about this both here and later, is hashes are great, but uh, we've been drunk on them for some time. Like, hashes are fine, and you can pass in options and all these things, but you can definitely take it too far, and there's been plenty of places where we have taken it too far. Um, you see here, you say user where name equals something. Instead of the whole conditions, pointing at a, um, and another hash and all this setup. It just feels like, ugh, it's too much. And secondly, the awesome part of this stuff is that you can keep decorating it. That's what I really love about it. Um, active relations in Rails 3 makes everything lazy. No query is immediately executed until you need something from that query. So you can keep building it up. Um, and then it's triggered 
when you actually need the thing, when you're pulling users out of that array that you just, uh, or that query that you just built up. Um, the cool thing about this is it seems like, all right, I'm just building my query. What am I really getting from this? Um, eh, it's slightly prettier. That's fine. What you're really getting from this is that you can build your query in stages. So HiRise, which is one of the applications we have at 37 Signals, has a pretty heavy-handed permission system. Who can see what at what times? You don't want every single query everywhere to know about that. You want to bubble up permissions from some layer down below, and you would not believe the hoops that we had to jump through to make that a pleasurable process before we had this. Whenever a query is just executed right away, it's a real hassle to build it in phases. So this is going to be great for, for stuff like that. Now, what's also great about stuff like this is that it provides more consistency to the stuff that we already have. We already have these scopes. And scopes now are just part of that partial buildup. They're named um, queries on the existing classes that we have. And we can combine all this stuff with the new beautiful syntax for declaring um, queries and with the, the stuff that we already have. Like, you can combine it and put a scope after another scope, and it'll automatically just figure out what's going on, latest with middle name. Um, we'll run these two queries and merge the conditions together in a very easy uh, to use kind of way. There's no of all this with scope nonsense where you have to use blocks and blah, blah, blah. And you can keep decorating on it too, which is really cool as well. So you can say user latest with middle name and say, do you know what? Normally this query returns 50 items. Yeah, I just need 10 right now. And it's not a limit after the fact. Like It's not like first you query the database for 10 or 50 items, and then you just cut it down to, to 10. You ask the database to do a whole lot less stuff, which is just, it's amazingly pretty. It's more efficient. Um, you get to delay your queries. You get to build them up in stages. And it becomes easier. And this is really the magic of a lot of the Rails 3 stuff. It's, it's not that we're tackling harder problems with hard solutions. It's that we're tackling harder problems with stuff that's simpler than what we had before. And that's really the key. And that's why we spend an enormous amount of time worrying about the APIs. Because I think it's very easy as a framework matures to move with your users. So you stay focused just on the people who already know Rails, who are already deep into it, and you just want to solve their more complex problems. Well, that doesn't take very long until you end up with something that only the um, people you already had all along can use, that nobody else can come in anymore. And I think that's probably the part of Rails 3 I'm most proud about, that I think the barrier of entrance has gone down. We're solving a whole lot of other intricate, complicated problems that existing Rails developers have. But for new guys coming in, the whole thing looks simpler, works simpler, is more consistent, and it's prettier. Um, that's really a big part of it. Now, these two parts, um, the actual relations stuff, which uh, Pratik worked a bunch on getting into the code, and, and Carl and Yehuda worked a bunch on, on Bundler, uh, are all awesome things. Now, I want to talk about a few things that I worked on myself. And go over sort of the decisions that made us come to, um, to where we are, go through how do we actually develop an API. How do we actually get into why is it supposed to be named this, why it's supposed to be named that? Because I think it'll shed some light on just the development process that we have and hopefully invite more people to get into the game. Um, a big part of Rails 3, obviously, is that we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of contributors. If you look at the patches going into Rails 3 just on a weekly basis, you see new names all the time. Um, and the more sort of in line and in sync our API development process and sensibilities are, the easier and the more patches we can apply faster. All right. The router. So the router, as it is in its current 2 3 form, um, started out a long time ago. It started out uh, long before we worried about resources, uh, which I believe was in Rails 1 2, was the first uh, uh, attack at that. And it was, it was a clutch. Like, we added it on to something existent that wasn't designed for this to happen. I think we pulled it off fairly well, and it was sort of an experiment in the beginning. 
we all weren't sure whether this was a prudent, good way to develop applications and whether we would keep on with this rest and resources stuff for a long time. Well, the answer's been in for a few years. We are. Like, we're not going back. We're not going back to a, a non-REST world for the majority of applications coming out. And this is a good way to develop applications. Thus, let's take a step back, look at what we have, and realize um, if this is going to be the default path, the optimal approach to developing Rails applications, the code should reflect that. That should be the majority case. So let's look at what's wrong with this. Map resources people has one avatar, and it has some member actions. Well, first of all, it just doesn't look good. It had the same problem that the other code we looked at. Um, there's like too much stuff going on in too little space. It's very concise, you can say, uh, in terms of number of characters, or actually not even in terms of number of characters. In terms of number of lines, it's very concise. But conceptually, it's not very concise at all. It's very muddy. One of the reasons here is flow ownership. So if you look at the hash one, hash one avatar, has one avatar, hash one avatar, has one avatar, and then the next one is member pointing to something. So who are these member actions for? Are those for the avatar or are those for the people? If you just read it out like you normally would, it kind of looks like it's for the avatar. It kind of looks like who does this belong to? It's not clear from just looking at it. And I know, we get into the pattern, we know how it works, and then it doesn't bother us. But when we take a step back and look at it, it's like, this isn't right. There's something wrong here. The flow is wrong. Second, hasheritis. We have the same problem that we had with the, with the queries. There's just too much hashing going on. There's all these pointers and all this stuff um, where eh, it doesn't feel like. We are cramming too much into it. We have to come up with some sense of uh, pulling these things apart so it's not just all mashed into one big complex thing. Now, one thing we tried was, all right, let's do a yield. So let's solve the hash one avatar and just do a yield instead. And then it'll say, all right, member is a little closer to, to people now. So it's a little closer for a relationship. Um, but yeah, then you have this problem with the yield overhead. Then you had to say, do people and people.resources. Mm, didn't feel quite right. Now, this is the new API for Rails 3 and the router. So much simpler, so much cleaner. The only thing we use is the simplicity of indented scopes. You say, resources people, start the scope. Oh, it has a resource avatar. It's not all tangled up in one line. It's actually way more code. If you did a, a, a code lock thing, you'd say, what the hell? You ballooned my Rails app from two lines to six, what, eight lines. That's a terrible setback. No, it's not. This is so much easier to read. We are trading line length for um, lower complexity. Now, it solves both the, uh, the flow ownership because it's very clear now. It's just indention. Everything runs off that. It solves the hasheritis by just making these uh, get, post, and put uh, member operations really explicit. Um, and there's no yield overhead. Well, this is a pretty, uh, pretty nice piece of progress. But I thought you hated Instant Evolve. For a long time, I've ranted and raved against Instant Evolve. Um, which is the, the concept of, of not using uh, uh, a yielded parameter like do people and just do straight do something and then evaluate what, what's in that block within the scope of where you came from. I don't even know if that's a coherent explanation. But for a long time, I didn't like that because it felt more complex in some sense. Like if you wanted to put your own code in there, uh, were you going to trigger something that was already there? Were you going to override something? When, you, when you're yielding, yielding a specific variable, like you can chain everything off that, and you can know, like, I'm not messing with anybody else's stuff. In this instance, well, um, if I'm calling something member, like I'm calling the yielded function here. I, I, I can't not do that. So there's plenty of reasons not to like it. And when your routes file looks something like this, it's just all chained off one major yield. That is the right choice. And that's, I think, a fair amount of, of what I want to talk about here is like the pressures 
the concerns, um, the things we had to worry about changed. The way the route file used to work, where everything was just a single line, there was no deep nesting, everything was just controller, action, value, lineups, it worked great. It even worked great for the simple map resources comments. And in those cases, it is worth to keep uh, instant eval out, because it's not worth just saving map. What it is worth, though, if you look at this second example, which is a real example, I've yanked all of these examples straight from the routes files I have on specific apps, there's too much. Like, it's not worth it anymore. And I think that that's the interesting part about a lot of the trade offs that we did for Rails 3 um, was that there are times where both approaches make sense. It is figuring out when is the majority case once that tips it over. Now, the bottom one is the majority case. The top one is not the majority case anymore. So it's time to, to do something about that. And Instant Evil made everything a whole lot prettier. So, coming off Instant Evil, um, one of the things I was sort of um, a little queasy about was, well, what if you want to do a lot of Ruby inside your routes file? Routes RB is just a Ruby file. You can run every, any piece of code that you want and iterate and blah, 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 and instant evil. I don't like that when there's too much mingling. I don't like when you have an instant evil-based DSL um, where you want to run too much of your own code because that's when I see, like, that's the conflicts that arise. So one of the reasons for pushing back against this was the notion of um, with options. This is, again, a piece of uh, routing code that I have for one of the apps that isn't converted to the new style. What we have with options, which is basically just saying all this stuff that's being yielded are going to have the same hash uh, options here. Like This was an example of using generic piece of Ruby code to automate some parts of the routes API. Um, and this was pretty much the only one I could find. I was looking through all of my routes file and was seeing this was repeated over and over and over and over again. Of the generic pieces of uh, syntax I was using, the common pattern was just with options. So obviously you think, all right, we see a, a common pattern with generic syntax. Well, all sorts of bells should go off. Time for extraction, time for extraction. We should pull it out and make this simpler, which is what we did. So if you take all that piece of code we just had, you can now rewrite it into this. Everything can be built as a scope, uh, following the same rules of, of, of flow as we had in the other examples. They're not just related to resources anymore. This will work on anything. This, for example, is not a, a resource map up. In fact, this is kind of a hack we're using in high rise, where we have two different paths that go to the same controller. Um, and we only use those paths on the index action. We have a parties controller, and you can get to it from people, or you can get to it from companies, and we do different things in the view depending on it. But this just looks so much simpler, because we realize with options, with this common pattern, we can just extract it into a scope. And when you extract it into a scope, you start looking at the second set. Well, two parties index. Like, this is a very short, succinct way of describing something. Feels a little weird, though. Like, when we first premiered this, there was a lot of pushback. Like, this is kind of like the Ruby syntax for declaring whether something is an instance variable on a class, but you're using lowercase, and it's not really a class. Um, like, what's going on here? Like, this doesn't feel quite right. Now, if you look at how this plays out, these are the two sources of inspiration that we have for that syntax. So on the one hand, we have the former way of declaring where a route went to, controller and action. Uh, and on the other hand, we had the inspiration of looking at just the, the common pattern of, of declaring a, uh, an instance method on a class. Now, the interesting thing, I think, in design and in API, this API design is not slavishly just following existing conventions. It is looking for pieces of inspiration, pieces of recognition in stuff you already have, and then extracting that out, fusing it together, um, and coming up with something that's derived from that. Like, that's where the magic happens. The magic wouldn't happen if we had just said, all right, we've got to follow the, exactly the same format as the uh, Ruby class. It would have to be capital P, parties, controller, hash mark, index. Because now we would have all these controller, 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 controller all the way down, because everything you route to is a controller. Eh, it wouldn't be right. Um, 
So this is sort of the pattern that we've, we've used for that. Now, awesomeness comes when you then realize that one insight opens the door to a whole slew of other simplifications. The scope thing that we just talked about, we can use that for anything now. One of the key problems with the previous implementation of map resources was if you wanted to do anything that wasn't exactly map resources, you were screwed. You had to basically do everything uh, from the start. That didn't work very well. Now we have uh, this generic scope thing that we can go through um, and use everywhere. And these are just a few of the examples, real life examples, that people are using scope for where they can keep the existing resources. There's one for a token where you have to, a token to get into a room. There's one for even using an optional scope for uh, a locale, for a language of a, of a design to get it in there. And you can combine them as you please. You use namespaces with the scope. And as you can see here, this reminds me so much about what we did for, for Active Record. It's the same way of deriving something and boiling it down into a few simple comp, uh, um, ideas that you can then combine as you see fit, and it has internal consistency. And it works for stuff that's, uh, that's even outside the box. That was a big part of it. Map resources with this hard-coded macro that only worked for exactly that case. These concepts work for everything. All right, this is the first one we're just translating. Oh, it looks kind of the same. Like, there's not a whole lot of difference there. Translate it a little bit more, and we can start having this progressive inference, where we start taking options away as they are guessable from the thing you came from, uh, and all the way down to just get account cancel. It's pretty awesome. Um, this also comes with the fact that we're killing the old wildcard mapper, like, which is basically the tombstone saying, resources and the new way of declaring things is the way to go. Do not just use a wildcard mapper anymore. It's over, it's done. You can add it back in if your legacy the application depends on it, but it's bad news. All right, um, action mailer. Action mailer is another one of those things that for a very long time irked me just with its ugliness. This was how it used to look. We had these instance variables we would assign things to, and there were all these variables. This is a real example. We still have this code in, in backpack. Now, we tried the first step at making that slightly prettier, and all we did was end up removing the instance variable markers. Eh, that's not very pretty. The holdup here was realizing we had all of these things we had to assign. Like, uh, how can we make this simpler? We can't just turn it into a hash, then we're going to have all these keys. We can't just make it method calls, then we're going to have all these calls. This is just too complex. And that was the underlying assumption. The under underlying assumption was there was five calls you had to make for every mail, and there's no way around that, which is why we were at a standstill for so long. Now, all right, at some point we started looking at this more critically and seeing patterns. First of all, from being set, I always set it from a constant or a class variable. It was a hidden default. It was not something that every single mail action needed. All right, we can probably deal with that. The send thing, the send thing was like a test mechanic we put in there for easy comparison of, of two strings of mails. Don't need that anymore either. Um, a natural consistency, we were trying to shove the passover of variables to the view into the same syntax because that was what the other five calls were. And we thought, you gotta have this consistency. No, you don't. If you rip out all these three things, you can get to this. So much prettier. We extracted the default into a real default, put it up in the top. No more males have to, to worry about this. Um, and then we built the rest as a controller. Mailers for a long time had this split personality. On the one hand, they were kind of like a controller. On the other hand, they were kind of like a, a model because they were, you called them yourself. There wasn't some dispatcher calling them. Uh, and they, it was stuck in the middle and was getting the worst of both worlds. Now we said, all right, screw that. This is going to be a controller. That is the pattern that we're going to follow. And all of a sudden, things just, like there was no design left. Like that was the breakthrough. Just making a decision saying, this is that. As you can see, this is just a comparison of a controller and a, a mailer, and they look just alike. Like the syntax for it is almost the same. Now, once that breakthrough came, like it was sort of like opening the floodgates. You looked at something like this, which again is almost a real piece of code, which is horrible, a way of declaring a, a, a mail having two, uh, two parts and assigning it, uh, really just nasty, nasty stuff, and we were all doing it. In the new way of doing it, we follow exactly the same model as we do for the controllers. They have multi-view. They can have multiple templates. And if they do, you automatically render them. And if you need to do something special about them, you can just use format. 
Like there was no design left. We just borrowed all the concepts as well as we could, and it turned out it all just worked. The borrowing concept goes even deeper. Look at this one, where we're trying to add attachments to, to the mail. Now, in the new format, we're just using um, attachment hashes, which works just like cookie hashes, the hashes did. Like, for a long time, we were stressing out, how do we add these attachments? We already did all the design work. Now we have the breakthrough that it can work just like cookies. And actually, these things often feed into a cycle. As soon as you start realizing the one breakthrough, you have now two implementations of the same idea. You start seeing something that was wrong with the original idea. Cookies was a great example of that. You have this cookie setup where you would assign a hash to it, and I would have this all over my code. I wanted eternity cookies, and they were just there for a long time. Now we wrap that up in just cookies.permanent. That will automatically set this, that it's going to last for 30 years. Much simpler approach to it. Uh, we even added signs such that you can assign something um, that you need to keep unchangeable for the user, something we often do with Remember Me cookies. Um, and a funny little thing here, just that um, seeing there's no parity here. So it's an asynchronous sort of hash API. You assign something on cookies.permanent.sign, but you read it on cookies because it doesn't make sense or it doesn't matter whether you're reading it from. Now, this actually, the next slide, fed straight back into this. Last night, Mikkel was working on the uh, Action Mailer API, and we were treating this back into the, um, uh, the setup of how this was going to work. Like, how are you going to link to an attachment in a mail? Um, he had this idea you would assign something to a variable, and then you would link to act to that variable. We don't need to do that. Use the same idea from um, cookies. Like, we have cookies.permanent or cookies.signed. We can just use attachments.inline uh, to run this up, and then you can have an inline attachment, and you can link through it. It's an object now. You can just call it .url. You don't need to assign anything internally. Um, awesome. All this flowing from just realizing the similarities and reiterating across that. All right. That was my sprint on uh, Rails 3, on the main features that I care about. This, uh, if this was all we had, this would be more than plenty of reason to upgrade, and it's a lot of fun to play with these new APIs. Um, but just before I stop, I, I'll... I do sometimes get sucked into vaporware code, and it is kind of fun just to talk about what is <laughs> going, to, going to come. Um, so let me talk briefly about just qu three quick ideas that uh, I have for Rails 3.1 that I want to work on, um, or actually preferably want somebody to work on so I can enjoy. Um, number one, asset pipelining. So, Right now, we have this split where all the important stuff is in app, and the junk drawer of assets of JavaScript style sheets and images are in public. And public is usually a big mess. You just throw shit in there, and then you link to it. And app is this beautiful place where you use extractions and neatly uh, organize everything. Like public is for designers, those messy kids. App is for the high-level programmer stuff um, that we care about. Now. That's not really um, a good way of going about it, because as soon as you put something into a junk drawer, you forget about it. And we've been forgetting about style sheets and JavaScripts and ways we can optimize that for a long time. Uh, let's not do that anymore. What we're trying to do is we want pre-processing to happen. We want JavaScripts and style sheets to go into the app directory such that we can work on it with code. It's not just text that you can't mangle anymore, now it's going to be code just like regular views, so you can use ERB and you can use anything else that you want. And most importantly, once it's in that process, we can compile it down to something. So there's a lot of different, there's something called sprockets for JavaScript, there's a lot of other ways of trying to get a lot of JavaScripts into one piece of JavaScript. Um, this should absolutely be in Rails. Every single app out there has a huge performance benefit for compiling JavaScripts and CSS down to a single file, a single request that can be neatly compressed and served to the user as fast as possible, and you don't have to do any work for it. And the cool thing is, as soon as you start saying, all right, we have a pipeline, we have processing, we have code we can apply, magic opens up. Number one piece of magic, um, dealing with icons, images, and boiling them down into sprites. Creating sprites today is a freaking hassle, and it's a huge benefit. On um, high-rise right now, we're currently working on 
boiling it into sprites. I believe we had 29 separate image requests to request a high-rise index page. 29 requests that you had to do to get all the icons, the trash, the, the plus, the, all that stuff. If you compile that into a sprite, a single image, and just reference it through style sheet, it becomes so much faster to go through. So that's what we're going to do. CSS is now code. We can insert helpers in there. So we can say, all right, sprite CSS, this is all pseudocode, none of this works. Um, you point it at, uh, don't get too excited, you point it at a, a, a folder, icons, it'll automatically render a sprite based on the files that are in that, so trash and the plus, and you can then reference it in the, um, in the view. Just say sprite tag, It'll all have the, the, um, the CSS build up, and you just reference it logically from the path variables. No configuration, no setup. It just happens as part of the compilation pipeline. Um, another quick thing, as you can see, I'm getting increasingly, uh, we've actually been for a long time, obsessed with the speed of web applications. And what we found by looking at real stuff is off repeated pattern, it's not the code that matters that much anymore. If your code is just reasonably fast, say 500 milliseconds or less, Users don't notice. What they notice is that all the other shit takes three seconds. Downloading the CSS, downloading style sheets, blah, 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 blah. A big part of that is, look at this chart. So this is some app rendering. You have the first part taking almost 800 milliseconds uh, for the code to generate. And then you have all the other stuff coming past, uh, after that. Now, Jeremy came up with this awesome idea. I'm sure he saw it from somewhere else. And I actually just read that Facebook is looking into this with Big Pipe, which is the notion of the flush. So if you could flush your head section of whatever it is that you're generating, the part that links to style sheets and CSS, before you're done processing the rest of the stuff, you allow the browser to start fetching these things so much sooner. You can basically move all the rest of the processing up about 500 milliseconds or however long it is that it takes to uh, render your page. All this for inserting a strategic name flush. Awesome. Well, final bit. Um, I'm always looking at these APIs uh, and seeing things that just annoy me. This is a key example of something that annoys me. Create table, drop table, where the drop or the down part of a migration is always the fucking same. Like, I always see just drop, 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 and it's always naming the same thing. It's always just naming the inverse, where that's really unnecessary. We don't need to do all that manual labor. What if we instead just had a, uh, a proxy that we could record all this stuff off such so that it could record what it is that we were adding to it, and then it would automatically know what we have to, um, to go back from. All right, that's the whirlwind tour. Thank you so much.